So without further ado, my name is Caitlin Thaney. I'm here from a company called Digital Science, which for those of you who've been here for day one and day two, I think you've probably encountered a number of the things that we support at Digital Science um, and also met some of my colleagues. So this will give you a bit of an idea as to how I view open innovation. Um, I'm glad that Will was able to give the primer so it saves me having to do too many allusions to Henry Chesborough, who I know from uh, UC Berkeley, who coined the term open innovation and his ideas and models, and Eric von Hippel, who we used to work with at MIT when I was still based over in the US. So I think we can get most of that out of the way. Um, but for the discussion here today, I'm going to start off and give you a little bit of background as to who we are, how we're approaching open innovation and why this is important to us in terms of a model that is taking ideas and, and some you know, development from the university with the expert, domain exp expertise of helping to make research more efficient and bridging that with not only business but investment, et cetera. So uh, it'll, g it'll become much clearer as this uh, presentation goes on. But Digital Science, we are a technology company uh, that was started as a technology division of Macmillan Publishers back in 2010, in late 2010. Now, why Macmillan Publishers making a play into this, uh, and I will, I've already said this on Twitter, I will clarify right at the outset, we are not nature. Uh, nature is one of our sister businesses in the same sort of way that Pelgrave and Pan Macmillan, et cetera, we all sit within. Um, but we were formed out of that model. Uh, some of our staff does come from nature, but we were created deliberately to be separate from that as a software company that could create tools and, and resources to help the research community, not just the actual researchers at the bench, but also those that are working, say, in industry and in pharma and biotech, or those that are working on the decision-making side. So the research administrators, the institutional leads, um, and also the funders that we view as part of the entire research ecosystem. So we were created to not only create tools internally, but also to help support the existing ecosystem. Um, we have an, an interesting model with this, which I'll go into in a little bit, part of which is, is why um, when we were approached to speak about open innovation, we feel like it's a very natural fit, because there aren't a terrible amount of others that are doing what we do in this space, and that's not even just a, a boast. There really aren't. Um, you'll hear from some others here in this segment about efforts at universities, um, but we sit completely separate from that. Our main headquarters are based in London. We have a Boston office where we've got a number of our startups working out of, and we've got staff in New York, Tokyo, work with others in Canada, Israel. So we really are global, trying to make sure that we treat it as the global enterprise that research is and work with those that can influence it in various capacities. So to harken back, um, I know that this has probably been referenced quite a few times that, okay, the web was created by a scientist. I'm gonna go back a little, a little bit before uh, Tim Berners-Lee was sitting at CERN and go back to ARPANET in 1977. Now, I mean, first packet switching network, um, you know, starting back then, how we were gonna start to be able to transfer information, whether it was for the Department of Defense or whether it was then for others in a research context to be able to use. And I see Gully is pointing out something specifically on that, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave this slide very soon. But you know, why is this relevant? You know, for something that was created to help facilitate in the, in the very early outset, the transfer of information for the scientific research enterprise, you think that we would have this down pat. I mean, this is a tool that's kind of created for us, a vehicle for us, but it's not. The web has transformed all of the other components of our lives, become really ubiquitous in how we manage our photo collections, our music collections, how we even think of commerce. When was the last time you even really thought about how to do, make a purchase online or to go to you know, your favorite store to even now o o order your groceries and have them delivered? It has become so ingrained in what we do, yet for arguably the longest running enterprise, and in my personal opinion, the most important enterprise that we have and how we can understand the world, how we can understand disease and understand ourselves. This hasn't been ported, and it's getting incredibly frustrating. I love this quote by Cass Sunstein, um, talking about that how traditions last not because they're excellent, but because influential people are averse. And I'll sub out influential people, and I'll go to like researchers and scientists and PIs, um, averse to change because of the sheer burdens to transition to a better state. Now they know it's a better state. I can sit down and have conversation, and I have over the last eight years of my career in this space, and say, you know, this actually could help cure 
various diseases, if you were to just get together, collaborate, do things in a slightly more digital, digital context, but for some reason it hasn't necessarily taken off in the way we want to. Now looking at what we can possibly do, my personal mission is to take research practices that arguably are still lingering from the 19th century and try to drag them hand over foot into the 21st. And this is what some of the companies that we work with are doing and also some of the people that we're working with internally. So one main lesson for open innovation, because we do operate as an incubator and a investor in scientific startups. Some of those being groups that we work with that are working in a research context, haven't necessarily even finished their PhD or had ever thought of really building a business and helping them take their idea and spread that to and expand its reach to help others in the research community. Really looking at how we can make research more efficient and how we can make the web work for science. So main takeaway, avoid, avoid reinventing square wheels. Um, the square aspect kind of plays to those that should know better but don't, uh, and they still try to make some of the same mistakes. Um, the best minds are usually outside of your walls, and this was really deeply embedded into what digital science was created to do back when conversations first began in 2009, 2010. In the research enterprise, when it comes to software and when it comes to tools, there is quite a reputation for having big tech companies come, suck up the innovation, reinvent it, and ship it back out to the researchers. And this isn't necessarily what we think is the most efficient means. Most of our startup founders come from, uh, come from environments like this. Actually, almost all of them come from an actual research background out of university, whether they were managing a research lab, working as a bioinformatician, getting their degree in stem cell biology, or even working with the Structural Genomics Consortium in Canada. Um, these are people that know better than anybody else, despite many of us in digital science and in the core team coming from the research world, um, they know the problem intimately, inside and out. And they crafted solutions to get around some of these day-to-day -day problems more so than others who might create a solution so they know that they can immediately sell. They created solutions so they could help their peers and help get to the end of what they're trying to do. These are the eight main public projects that we have thus far. These are external investments um, in various levels of incubation and support, but we do serve as a majority stakeholder in almost all of these businesses here. Some of them sit with us in London, some sit in Boston, DC, et cetera. Um, and I'll, I'll walk you through a couple of examples here as well. And you can find out more on our website about them too. Beyond that, we also work to encourage and support the existing ecosystem for those that might not necessarily have ever thought of creating the tools and moving it forward. Um, I run a grant program as well for, um, for digital science called the Catalyst Program, and these are bootstrapping grants, up to 15,000 pounds for six to eight months for someone to be able to get some technical help or maybe a server um, or even bring in you know, a product manager so they can turn and develop some ideas of their own. And we've got two examples here. We've got a couple more that have just been funded um, in terms of prototyping grants. One on the bottom, uh, Michael Schmidt, he, when he was finishing his PhD with a um, relatively well-known researcher in the U.S., Hod Lipson, created a means of, of doing sort of DNA, or not, uh, he called it almost like a DNA fingerprinting for data sets. So you could check the similarities using mathematical analysis. When one of the more interesting ones, even though Michael's work is absolutely brilliant, is Ruben, who's up at the top, who's a clinical psychologist who was administering tests that he wanted to be able to do instead of by pen and paper, he wanted to automate that. And he was later on in his career, had never even considered creating a tool, but said, hey, it's worth a punt. And these are things that might not necessarily ever get full on investment from us or fit into our portfolio, but we find it very useful to try to encourage that behavior so people understand that there is a means to move forward so they can get the experience. I know I'm gonna blow quickly through this. Second main takeaway from our view of open innovation is that we're, our definitions are evolving. I mean, this is something that's been belabored in a number of different conversations here at the conference so far, but so are the containers. One thing that I find really interesting about open innovation is starting to break apart some of the understandings and some of the silos, and even silos down to the level of the content that's located in a scholarly paper or as part of that research workflow. Um, you know, from the way that we look at lab notebooks and we're starting to digitize and, and add additional functionality to that, 
to even little bits that often get neglected, like the expiration dates for biological materials, which we may spend six months to a year trying to acquire, only to find out that the efficacy for that antibody is a complete crapshoot, and we have to start back at the beginning and losing our money for it. And there's a couple like nods in the audience of people that have been through this problem. Or just poorly managing it because it's not linked to the traditional researcher in the lab. It might be done by a lab manager. So trying to minimize waste. Also trying to stitch together the protocols, parameters, the calibration, et cetera, so that research can be reproducible, so that we don't have to try to sit there and you know, recast a cast iron pan every morning before we want to make breakfast in the research context. And also making sure that we're paying attention to the devices and the changes there. One of, our, um, bit, one of the businesses that we work with is now experimenting with um, use of mobile technology in the lab so that you, know, you can get around some of the kind of hazardous um, has just material use that precludes you from having a digital interface so that you could start to plug in um, the bits of your experiment and can in that instead be able to follow the experiment on an iPad and have that sync your data back as well. So trying to see if we can stitch that in, in too. And really trying to minimize the wasted time, the wasted money, I mean those materials, they cost quite a bit of money. You're talking about about 400 US dollars for some antibodies, just one, um, only to find out it doesn't work. And just resource in general. I mean, we can do a lot better with the technology that we have that just hasn't been necessarily mapped or done so with a way that's really useful for the researcher. So some of the examples, I, I won't spend much time on this slide because I think not only with Mark speaking yesterday, many people have started to work um, with Figshare, but this is a means of getting credit for all of your research crafted by Mark when he was finishing up his stem cell PhD at Imperial College. Um, Mark was looking for a means to be able to not only make data sets available, but videos, gray literature, um, other figures and, um, and, and images, and trying to find a way to get credit for that so you could st start tilting the way we look at behavior. And this is starting to take and make it so that data might one day be treated as a first class citizen in the research context. And I'm really hopeful for that. Altmetric, which also has been referenced before, looking at some of the information sources that are outside of traditional research workflows so that we can start to measure impact in different ways and really start to look at that broader context and get a fuller picture of how this work is being perceived by the community instead of just within perhaps a closed circle of peers. One of my favorite examples here in terms of looking at some of the technologies that we're used to as digital consumers outside of our work lives and porting that into the research process is just the way that we look at sort of evaluations and I've plugged in some familiar names here as well. I mean, when was the last time that you booked a hotel or something significant for a trip or you made a sig uh, significant investment in terms of a purchase for your home or for your office without plugging that into Google and seeing what some rating system, be it TripAdvisor, be it eBay, um, be it, you know, uh, you know, be it Amazon, to see what people how they perceive that. Yet, for biological materials, this is the first open alternative that pulls together listings from catalogs and pairs it with reviews from researchers so that we can start to get around that efficacy problem I was telling you about with antibodies, which is really serving as a severe bottleneck um, in the research capacity. And this is something called One Degree Bio. There's also the information sources, like I was saying before, for the research administrators and the institutional leads. So that research, um, research administrators and provosts can have a snapshot of the outputs and the activity at their university in real time. You would think that this would have been really commonplace, but it takes things like the research excellence framework and other sorts of data collection exercises to get people to start paying attention that calling up each department and writing it down on paper is a really big waste of time. You know, we can do better, we should do better. These are the leading minds in the world. And then also being able to then map into that additional things beyond just your paper count, beyond just the, the classes you take or the classes you teach, but looking at co-authorship, seeing what insights you can pull from that. Are we only seeing that, very, that two, work, two researchers are working together and that's where most of their citations are coming from? You can start to build in a lot of interesting, um, interesting analysis from there as well. And this is a product that we have called Symplectic. Lastly, because I know that we're a bit crunched for time, um, our practices are limiting us. And I would even go so far and be so bold to say in some ways that they're harming. This gets into how you know, we, we perceive the incentives and the rewards in this system, really looking at how we can start to change the behavior, which then can influence and instill best practice and, and bring 
some of the researchers it's slightly more into the fold when it comes to using digital technology and introducing efficiencies into their day-to-day -day lives. Now, we're looking at changing models of authority and community. I know that we just had a panel before this on changing models of uh, peer review, but looking at also how this affects reproducibility. The fact that you know, most scientific discoveries were discovered by accident, you know, it's not how it should be. We should start having these mechanisms baked into the framework of how we teach science and how we measure science so that we can, we can eliminate some of this, um, some of this FAF. One of, the, one of my favorite quotes that's been uh, bandied about quite a bit today, and I've, I've refrained from making a comment about it, about standing on the shoulders of giants. This is actually, to me, reflective of the flaws that we have in the incentives and reward system. This isn't something to be proud about. I mean, granted, it does date back before this, before anybody says it, it dates back to ancient Greece and things. But Isaac Newton, he scooped Hook, right? I mean, this is ind indicative of the fact that the, the reward system was set up or at least in this place, was used so that people were treating it as much more of a competitive, in a competitive sense, in the negative aspect, and you know, and trying to make sure that everybody is doing the work that they um, need to move forward. So that's, that's probably one of the biggest ones I want to flip on the head. But to get back to the main point, we really are locked in old mechanisms. Paper is still king. Papers are still king, whether, um, whether they're online, whether they're in a, a print model, and we need to find ways of, of working within that regime, as people have said, and I know Brian Hull from Ubiquity Press was saying that people still care about the act of publishing, but how can we work within those frameworks and those understandings so that we can you know, not do harm to science and we can start giving recognition to other components that are long overdue? I won't spend too much time on this because I think it's almost common agreement that the existing system of how we measure and reward scientific practices Yep, is, um, is, in, is imperfect and we can do better instead of just making up numbers as Dilbert's alluding to. Um, and my last slide here is a few takeaways that I hope you get from this is that, you know, there are groups like Digital Science who are trying to help bridge and build businesses and help support and make sustainable businesses out of some of these ideas and help the research community. But also think before you reinvent, um, make sure that those, those design decisions, you, you get them right from out of the gate because we all know that, you know, in the age of the web, how many remember Prodigy and AOL? It's easier to build on open systems than it is on closed. And the last bit here about planning for the irrational, we're building tools for researchers, and, he, and if there's a human involved in the process, there still are gonna be slightly different boundaries that technology and pouring over social problems is not gonna solve. And that's it.